I'm looking forward. Yeah, we are looking forward to learn astrobiology from you as well. Heard a lot about you. <laughs> I, I will try my best to share with you whatever I have gathered over the years, okay. and I'm also looking yeah. forward to learn from you guys. Yeah. Also, Dilara is over here. She has done a project on astrobiology, like human radiation threats and space. Yeah, hi Dilara, and I have also uh, watched her presentation on YouTube regarding the space radiation and how it affects our minds. It was really interesting, and also congratulations for the publication. Thank you, thank you so much. So, what are you doing presently, Shubhajit? So, I am currently pursuing my masters, and okay. I'm. Right now, in my laboratory and in my university as well, I'm, I will. I'm live from my university's place. Oh God! <laughs> Do you in, did you invited your friends to join over? It would be interesting for them as well. Yeah, I shared it with my friends, and one of my friend is just sitting right now beside me. He will be oh, okay. listening and watching it along with me. And I've also told my colleagues at Space Manova as well about the oh, event. Wow. So let's see if they have time, they will surely join. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us. We will begin the session in the next two and three minutes until other people join. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Also today I would be talking about literature review. So can I just have you from the Lara and to visit since you guys are presenting any difficulties you encountered with literature review while doing your projects? Yeah, well, that's a really intriguing topic to talk about. And I'm also looking forward to learn various ways to do literature review in an efficient way, you know. Literature review is so crucial to form the hypothesis, but oftentimes it just takes up too much time and we really don't know which one to fish out well. So it, I'm really looking forward to gain some insights on how to do it effectively and efficiently from you. Mm, yes, I'm looking forward to share with you as well. What about you, Dilara? Any particular um, experience you wish to share with us? Well, I don't know if I have any um, tactics or anything, but the more you do it, I think the more you understand how to scan papers. And I think it really just takes a lot of practice, especially um, with understanding if the published article that you're looking through is has data that is um, critiqued well, or if it's peer reviewed or if it's not. So uh, I actually really look forward to your presentation as well um, because I'm, you know, interested in making more literature reviews. So I hope to learn some things today as well. Correct. We are also looking forward to learn from you and we shall begin the session now. A good evening to everyone from India and good morning to everyone on the other side of the globe. We are very pleased to have you all over here for today's Psyomics Club session. The theme for the session is Astrobiology, and we have two speakers who would be representing Astrobiology's theme and would be justifying it also. So first, we would start with Subrajit Barua, 
who is presently doing his master's in molecular biology and technology at SCAMT Institute, St. Petersburg, and has also been an ex-research fellow of Pine Biotech. He will be presenting on research experiences, career suggestions, and his projects he has done on astrobiology. After Subrajit's presentation, we would have Dilara Dickens presenting her uh, project on radiation threat on humans in space. She's currently doing her BSc in molecular biology and genetics from Bahashir University, Turkey. And after these two presentations, I myself would be talking about how to conduct a proper literature review for starting your research projects. But before starting with the session, I would like to brief you all about what Psyomics Club is, what do we do, and who are we. So Psyomics is a bioinformatics and data science student club, and it is an initiative taken by the students associated with Pine Biotech. One of the main goals of Psyomics Club is to help the student community learn more about bioinformatics research via group sessions, easy to take courses, and debates and discussion in depth. Not only this, but we also welcome students from all fields of life sciences to come meet together and learn from each other. We help each other to grow and understand the knowledge of bioinformatics. This club aims to encourage young minds to push their critical thinking limits beyond the school and college curriculum. We are also there on Telegram. The link is given over here and also on LinkedIn. If you are interested in presenting your published research work or project, you can email me with a request at wajarutri at the rate gmail.com. I'm Rutri Waja, currently serving as the president of Psyomics Student Club. So what do we do at every session of Psyomics Club? So Psyomics Club sessions are held every week on Thursdays. We have two to three sessions in a month where we have interactive Zoom sessions, we have debates on certain crucial health topics, and further on. So what are our main goals? So the main goals of Omics Logic and Psyomics Club is to provide training in bioinformatics, enabling independent research guided by mentors and peer examples. We also help students to do their research projects by the research fellowship program that we have, which would be shown to you all by the end of this webinar. Not only this, but we also develop a growing community with shared passion for data-driven research and appreciation of citizen science. We enable students, clinicians, and faculties of all backgrounds and student knowledges to develop novel and independent research using latest technologies in life and data sciences. We also have certain topics that we put a keen point on, namely infectious diseases, neuroscience, precision oncology, microbiology, that is consisting of microbes and microbiome studies, plant science, and further on. Our main motto is to help you guys to apply, to learn how to apply big data in biology. We also help students to clear basic concepts of bioinformatics to gain specific insight on how to use tools of bioinformatics in day-to-day -day analytics. We also have brainstorming sessions that helps each group of students to enhance their critical thinking abilities and how to apply the knowledge of coding and bioinformatics in day-to-day -day research is also being encouraged in this club. On our learn portal, we have two free courses for those who wish to learn more about bioinformatics and basics of bioinformatics in depth, namely introduction to bioinformatics and introduction to genomics. These are self-learning introductory courseworks related to bioinformatics and data science. Also, we have group discussions in which we do review report writing based on self access free courses that I just showed you. We have certain scientific debates on certain crucial bioinformatics topics. We have presentations on research papers. We have postdoc fellows and research fellows presenting their published or pre-published work. We also have discussions and exchange of ideas for the project development or project inculcation. So how to join the club? The WhatsApp group link of the club is provided over here or either you can email me at the email ID provided over here. 
we do not have any age restrictions and we welcome all the ages because i think that knowledge has no boundaries so i welcome you all to this session of the psionics club i would wish to hand over the session to subrajit now subrajit you can start sharing your screen thank you very much well thank you so much ruthvi that was pretty amazing to look through the presentation the design of fine biotech after such a long time you know it's always kind of a nostalgic journey for me to look at everything and so i guess uh, we are ready to go and thank you so much for this opportunity and providing me this platform once again to talk about this i know i don't know what happened in the past few years but this field has just got its golden era you can say and right now everybody every organization every department is talking about astrobiology so before we move on to talk about the fantastic and interesting aspects of astrobiology and the research domains that is present let me introduce you to who am i and let's just give you a brief introduction about me and my journey so far so as ruthvik introduced me i am an ex research intern at pine biotech and let me tell you i was the first ever research intern of pine biotech india so just like you guys are doing i have also gone through the courses and i earned my certificates and stuff and the mentors are so much friendly to me even today you can see we are very much i am in touch with elia and he was very kind enough to pen down some very nice and kind words for me and so, so that that's the environment that's the community we share at pine and even today i am really much very much in touch with almost all the mentors and it's pretty awesome but let me talk about what happened after that after i completed my pine internship and then what so i had this dream of coming to this beautiful city of st petersburg which is also known as the venice of the north and get enrolled in a university which is known as itmo university it was stands for information technology Mecha mechatronics and optics and that's the logo so i wanted to be a part of this university and study molecular biology and biotechnology but didn't really want to do it straight forward so i looked for a scholarship opportunity which is known as the open door scholarship which is provided by the russian governments and i hustled and got the result of the scholarship exam and scholarship project and i ranked fourth globally and also received a 100% scholarship from the government of russia and that led me to a direct admission to my dream university you can say uh, without any of the exam or entrance examinations and yeah finally i am pursuing my masters completely for free so let's talk about my research experience here so there's the scamped laboratories which stands for solutions of chemistry advanced materials and technologies that's a huge family you can see over here and currently i'm involved in various projects involved in various research groups trying to do something great in the field of astrobiology i would have loved to share the results with you but you know they are pretty much premature right now and not really i'm authorized not really authorized to share with them right now but maybe in a future uh, siamic session or maybe some other sessions when they are good to go good to be published i can talk about them more but finally i cannot forget space onova the company where i am currently the head at the department of astrobiology and let me quickly share what's the vision of space onova and why am i devoting my time to space onova well space onova is a company which has the vision to enable literally any space enthusiast to become a space technologist in any of the domain of space science they want and that's the kind of vision we all share and particularly being the head of the department of astrobiology i really want to understand the perspectives of life beyond the cosmic boundaries you know let me give you an example just like the nature of physics changed once we took into consideration the universal phenomenon like the dark matter or the phenomenons of black hole similarly it's my strong belief that biology would also see new heights will be explored in a different way will go beyond our expectations when we start looking at biology beyond the boundaries of earth you know so that's a lot about me and let's not talk about me much and let's devote our attention and time to this beautiful field called astrobiology let's not drift away from today's topic so 
you know this is a night sky and i'm pretty much sure you once in your life might might have looked up at the night sky looked up at these twinkling stars and glowing planets and wondered if you are the only one if earth is the only place where life is possible and you know with all the scientific advancements that we have had over the past decades and so mars seems to be one planet where life might be possible right now or might have been possible in the past we never know uh, that's our neighbor and so many missions are planned to mars but mars is not the only one we also have other candidates for example jupiter's moon europa maybe life exists on europa but so far over the years after studying and searching so much the only planet which we have discovered to have life in this universe is a dear pale blue dot or you know, also known as a blue marble earth so the question which i get asked almost everywhere everybody asks me this, this question that why do we really study astrobiology why are we so interested to search for life beyond earth what's the need well the short and crisp answer to that question would be we are natural explorers you know that's the human nature that's in our gene that's in our dna to explore to know but why the universe what's so special about that well let's take for example this particular comet you know or maybe let's take an example of any star for example the sun everything in this universe each and every object is made up of the same star stuff and what do i mean by the term star stuff well have a look at this this is a pretty familiar picture to you all right this is the periodic table of elements but it's color coded pretty differently and if you focus on suppose hydrogen the first element it's color coded in blue or azure color and in the legends you can find the term big bang fusion so hydrogen originates when it originated when there was a big bang fusion let's take for example carbon because every life form is made up of carbon right that's the most common element we know so carbon is green and yellow that shows exploding massive stars and dying loma stars so if you look at oxygen if you look at any other element discovered so far we would see its origin or its presence in some or the other stellar event in some or the other cosmic phenomenon and therefore we conclude that each and every object in this universe is made up of the same elements it's me whether it's me or it's you or it's a star or a black hole everything is made up of the same element and therefore we feel a strong connection between each of us and we want to explore them and know more about them so have we ever tried to contact the so called life beyond earth well to be honest yes we did try to contact them that's known as the arecibo message it was something looking like this i would explain what it means and it was devised by the great scientist frank drake in association with carl sagan and it was shot towards the globular star cluster m13 with a huge data that's 1679 bits of data 25000 light years away now what does this message contain what's the content of this particular message so if you look at the first if you look at the first le level here the whites it's the decimal system that we have the numbers 0 to 9 then comes the purple one the purple one is the elements which form our nucleic acids that is hydrogen nitrogen oxygen phosphorus coming to the green part this shows the different nucleotides that we have adenine guanine cytosine you know that very well then coming down it's a double helix structure of our dna this is a human structure that's pretty easy to understand here the yellow region shows the nine planets it was nine back then but now unfortunately pluto has been declared as a dwarf planet and finally the arecibo radio tower which shot this signal unfortunately this arecibo radio observatory was taken down a couple of years ago due to malfunctioning so we have tried to contact them the so called them but have we ever received any reply well to be honest we did but we really don't know from where it came from so we received a message from the so called sagittarius cluster or the sagittarius constellation which is pretty much visible in the night sky and this is termed as the famous wow signal well what is it this is a very sharp and strong radio signal 
sharp and very prominent than usual. So you can see the usual threshold, it was way beyond that. And the scientist, Jerry R. Ehman, was so impressed by this particular speed of this particular peak in the graph that he wrote wow beside the paper. And since then, we call it the wow signal. We really don't know whether it was an alien civilization which sent us this message, but definitely it was really exciting and interesting to get. So talking about life beyond Earth, do aliens really exist? That's one of the most common question or most common thought which comes to people's mind. The answer is we don't know. We have never ever detected any alien life form. We have never ever contacted them. But we do have some imagery of aliens, mostly inspired by the movies, you know, like this one. Maybe they are blue in color, uh, owing to the copper rich blood, maybe. Just like it's similarly seen in the octopus. Maybe aliens are green with three eyes, like this toy alien from the Toy Story movie. Or maybe aliens would be like a Yoda, and many people would agree. Who knows, maybe alien might not be so cute after all, and they are these ferocious beings with a hard exoskeleton with a scorpion-like tail, ready to pounce upon us and kill us the moment they detect us. Or maybe aliens possess this very high supreme powers like the Mad Titan Thanos from the Avengers franchise, and maybe they are on a mission to annihilate the 50% of Earth's population. The answer is we don't know, and the possibilities are endless. But I want to draw your focus to this particular creature. If you know what's the name of this creature, you can head down to the chat section and write it down. But I'm pretty much sure you would agree this is very peculiar, not something which we see in our locality. This is known as a Portuguese man of war. And from here, you would say that, OK, this is a creature with a ten, with few tentacles. That's common, but that's not the case. These are not its tentacles, but these are very small microbial animals living together in a colony in a symbiotic relationship, giving rise to the entire structure. And that's pretty awkward or pretty unusual. Similarly, have a look at this creature. This looks like a giant cockroach, right? With disgustingly large am amounts of feet. And this is something which we don't see in our home crawling. That would be disgusting. This is known as the deep sea giant isopod. And again, this creature is so unique. Similarly, have a look at this creature. What is this? Well, this is known as the axolotl. And what's so special or unique about axolotl? Well, axolotl, the unique characteristic feature of axolotl is they have reproductive properties or they show sexual reproduction or secondary sexual characteristics when they are a larva. We are, when they are, they are babies, but once they grow up, once they become adult, they lose that property. And that's known as retrogressive metamorphosis. So, you know, there's so much about life on Earth itself that we are not really aware of, even after so many years of research. So it begs us to ask the question, what is life? Do we really understand life? Now, if I ask you, what are those characteristic features which defines life or which segregates living beings from non-living beings? I'm pretty much sure you would all agree upon these particular points. For example, responsiveness or consciousness, growth, definitely living organisms grow, Metabolism and energy transformation, definitely that's key to survival and obviously reproduction. Without reproduction, living beings are as good as non living things. That's some people's ideologies. But you know, I came across certain examples which begged me to question my belief. Let's take, for example, responsiveness. Have a look at this picture. This particular thing which is moving here is a nanoparticle and it's responding to light, to the stimulus of light. So, Without any artificial help, this is showing responsiveness. On the contrary, here's a plant. What do you think? The, will the plant chase you and slap you if you break one flower or a, or a leaf? Well, a plant never does that, exceptions included. So, you know, even though they usually don't show responses, they are living beings and therefore responsiveness is pretty ambiguous. Let's take, for example, growth. You must have seen these balls, right? These are known as hydrogel balls. They have the property to absorb water and grow in size. And that's again growth, grow in, growth in size and volume. So again, it's, growth is pretty much ambiguous. Let's talk about metabolism and, and energy transformation. You would agree that this is a pretty important metabolic reaction that is 
respiration, the process of breaking down glucose with the help of oxygen, releasing energy in the form of ATP and carbon dioxide and water as uh, byproducts. But again, on the down picture, you can see paper burning. And that's again the same reaction, that's carbohydrate with the help of oxygen burning, releasing energy in the form of light and heat, giving out CO2 and H2O as byproduct. And again, that's a challenging question to ask. Finally, let's talk about reproduction. Well, you are all familiar with this particular picture and copying one particular file from one device to another gives rise to an independent file which has its independent identity, but it resembles its parent. That's pretty much what reproduction is. So, you know, if we talk about these characteristics, they lead to more confusion and more un unclarity. And therefore, maybe we should really think about defining life in a better way. And one of my friends suggested in one of the previous lectures that if we combine all these characteristics together and, uh, and, you know, combine them and confine them in a particular vessel, which we call a cell, maybe then we can define that this is something which we call as living being. Maybe that's a correct explanation, but we really need to understand life on earth and then only we would be in a position to understand life beyond it. Also the discovery of certain bacteria species, which we known as extremophiles, expanded the knowledge of life, expanded the range in which we can expect life. So here's a quick activity we can do. Think of three places where life can never exist according to you, three very hostile regions. If you ask me, well, it would be volcanic eruptions, high temperature, thousands of degrees of centigrade, and so many poisonous gases, there's carbon monoxide and stuff. So life should not ex uh, exist here. Well, similarly, in a very acidic lake, pH around one or even below that, and life should not exist in a place which is so highly acidic or maybe even alkaline. And the last place where According to me, I thought that life can never exist was the vacuum of space with so many harmful solar radiations. There's microgravity, there's low pressure, no oxygen. So pretty hostile conditions for life, right? Well, again, my beliefs got a death blow when I came across certain species of bacteria. For example, the Streptomyces thermophilic, which can easily survive in volcanic eruptions. Then there's Acidothiobacillus, thiooxidants, which can also thrive in highly acidic pH and in space, in the vacuum of space, completely exposed was Deinococcus radiourans, the bacterium species, which could survive for more than a year. And that groundbreaking experiment about the International Space Station completely changed the way we look at life itself. Talking about this particular experiment about the International Space Station, it spanned between May 2015 and May 2018. It was named the Tanpopo mission, and it was designed by JAXA, the Japanese aeronautical company and you know in the Japanese section of the International Space Station which is known as Kibo they exposed that anacocus radiourans without any artificial support and they found that they could survive pretty easily for more than one year. It's not that they, there was no change noticed definitely there was an ex, exo layer that was formed similar to something like an endosporter stuff which died and dried off but the interior was surviving and also scientists discovered that Deinococcus radiourans could survive so well because of its highly fast and efficient DNA repair mechanism. And that is pretty amazing to study further because if we can devise something and utilize that property, maybe we can realize the dream of long duration space flights without getting harmed someday. The Tanpopo mission also had another objective that was capturing the dust flybys at the highest level of the low Earth orbit, that is 400 kilometers from the Earth's surface. So these are ultra low density silica gels or aerogels, and they are very porous. So they were also exposed in the hope of capturing maybe, you know, life forms, microbes, or maybe some sort of amino acids. And now they have been brought back to Earth and research is going on with the help of PCR and so many other mechanisms. And who knows? fingers crossed and we might find something interesting in the future. Talking about extremophiles, there was a case study done in Brazil in the Sao Paulo and Sao Pedro archipelagos. And you can see here in the list, there were so many different types of extremophiles that were found. There was hyperthermophiles, thermophiles, cyclophiles, 
acidophiles and the list just goes on and on you can see that they can survive at staggeringly high temperatures or maybe very high radiation exposures can also not affect them and these extremophiles known as the polyextremophiles form the basis of astrobiological research nowadays and many people are interested in studying their genome doing some comparative genomics and stuff to understand them better where we can find these extremophiles that here's some example this is a cave in northeastern brazil then there's a very dry region where we can find some xerophiles also in the antarctic regions we can find underneath the snow regions we can find some extremophiles but um, we might talk about them later on some other day because really time is const a constraint here and we have to cover a lot so with all these examples something which is very clear is we really don't know much about the life forms on earth and just like the saying goes that charity begins at home i believe that astrobiology also begins on earth and is the best place to do research and to know about life so that we can be ready to identify life somewhere beyond earth now what is astrobiology well it's a very multidisciplinary subject very multidisciplinary field of science which incorporates under its umbrella a large number of fields of science but if i categorize them into very broad aspects there would be origin of life studying the ancient life forms in the prebiotic atmospheres their search for life beyond earth definitely which i was talking about and to do that we also need geology and the study of the environment and finally we have space health just like my fellow presenter dilara will be presenting her research today and that's on radiation that's a, an aspect of this particular domain of astrobiology that's space health how to take care the health of human beings and shield them from the cosmic harms one of the other aspect of astrobiology is the study of microgravity you know microgravity conditions open so many new dimensions to our understanding completely you must have seen such pictures of astronauts floating around in microgravity conditions but very interesting things also happen under microgravity conditions for example have a look at this water droplet you would never see a perfectly round water droplet on earth and that's because of gravity 9.8 meter per second squared the acceleration due to gravity but when somebody is in the microgravity conditions the gravity ceases to exist or at least ceases to dominate and then forces like surface tension can take over and similar things also happens with all the fluids in our body be it blood or lymph and they start flowing upwards against the gravity and that poses a lot of challenges to whoever does a space travel so it's really important to study all those phenomena and all those characteristics all the space flights are so interesting many people dream of becoming an astronaut there are a lot of challenges faced by them to list a few well definitely microgravity is a big challenge which they have to cope up with and adjust radiation is a big problem and again dilara has taken the first step to analyze those and their effects similarly there's low oxygen and pressure that leads to stress and when somebody is stressed when the body is stressed so many different mechanisms go on and it can be noticed i will be talking about them in just a while there's extremely fluctuating temperatures as well and a big problem to space flights is definitely bone and muscle density loss that's a reason why astronauts need to exercise at least 4 hours daily but that's not enough as well that's a huge amount of osteoporosis which is detected in those astronauts and we need to do something to counterfeed that and to enable the space missions to be more smooth we're talking about the research which can be done under this microgravity condition which is a very very interesting aspect and domain one thing which pretty much co coincides with fine biotech's ideologies and fine biotech's domain is a genomic response to study the differential gene expressions and similar something was done in association with nasa the astronauts whole blood transcriptome was analyzed before they left earth and after they returned after their mission and surprisingly it was found that 234 stress related genes were differentially regulated some were up regulated some were down regulated some completely stopped their expression and that's such a big challenge you would agree because as many as 234 stress related genes going berserk in a human body would definitely lead to certain physiological uh, phenomena and characteristic leading to certain diseases and that's pretty much an area where we need to focus and do more research talking about diseases in space well you must have heard about cancer right 
cancer is such a big challenge to anybody who travels uh, through space but it's not so sorrowful and not so depressing news after all because fighting cancer from space is a very new domain let me brief you what happened in this particular ex uh, research these uh, cancer cell lines were cultured on earth under simulated microgravity and also under real microgravity aboard the international space station and it was noticed that once microgravity kicks in these cell lines lose their potential to get adhere to the surface of the plus and they start floating and revolving and once they do so they form multicellular spheroids and these multicellular spheroids lose their property of getting attached to one another and that leads to the loss of cell signal function uh, signaling and the property of cell signaling and you know that completely blocks the process of metastasis you guys who are studying cancer would definitely know that metastasis is an important stage of cancer where it just becomes worst from worst and you know this study already gave that breakthrough that metastasis stops when microgravity kicks in and that would be something very interesting to study about and to know more to understand the cell signaling processes well so that we can devise something we can understand something which would lead to our successful treatment of cancer in the future you must be remembering about the example of bone density and muscle density loss that i was talking about a recent experiment uh, what they did was in a recent experiment was they genetically engineered certain mice and they knocked down the expression of myostatin and actin active in a coding gene and they found that after these mice which lack the these particular coding genes they become very much sturdier their muscle and their bones grow at a tremendously high rate that cell signaling processing is completely shut down so there's no limitation and therefore the muscle density and bone density loss is brought to a very low a very uh, rock bottom minimal you can say so that is another area another interesting domain to look into to study more so that we can understand how this is happening and if we can replicate them in humans and maybe who knows in the future just like these mighty mice we would send mighty astronauts onto the space station and even to mars who would not suffer from the problem of bone and muscle density loss there was another experiment which took place in association with merck and nasa and this is a monoclonal antibody known as keytruda that's again a cancer that's a treatment for cancer and what the scientists saw was they could form pretty much homogeneously and uniformly under microgravity conditions which they could not do in the control sample on earth because of gravity you can see such a chaotic picture here but here it's all well organized and homogeneous that led to the better characterization of these monoclonal antibodies which are highly efficient highly selective and targeting is almost 100% so again you as you can see these research open new domain into this sort of small molecule drug and biologics research and stuff finally let's talk about the recent launch from spacex which took place on june 3rd and they sent two passengers along with them that was the tardigrades or the water bears and baby squids the purpose of sending tardigrades to space was to analyze how they are so rigid how they are not degraded by microgravity conditions or harmful cosmic uh, radiations and to study that what are the genomic processes what's the what's happening at the genomic level that's giving them such a great strength the purpose of sending baby squids well baby squids are the model organisms for studying symbiotic relationships and that's the sole purpose to understand the symbiotic relationships which they do once they go to space and that can lead new horizons you know we human beings are also in a symbiotic relationship with so many microbes talking about our gut microbiome and it's pretty much important to understand the relationship between those symbioses and how it microgravity can alter or affect them so it's pretty much uh, good to say that space is a new lab and talking about where the lab is located well definitely the international space station is one of them we are also coming up with axiom which is going to be the world's first commercial space station russia is also going to launch their own space station by the year 2025 and good news for my indian fellows india is also going to launch their own space station and all of these space station will have dedicated microgravity research going on board them 
Now, finally, let me quickly talk about the career opportunities because that was one of the agendas. And let me tell that at the very beginning, it doesn't matter from which background you belong. You can still be an astrobiologist. You necessarily don't need to be, no, don't need to be a biologist to become an astrobiologist. You can be an archaeologist and study the history of Earth when the dinosaurs were extinct, when the oldest microbial fossil was found, the formation of Earth and also so often. And you know, you can be a biologist just like me. And most of you are biologists. Study the cell, the cell organelles, study the nucleus, the cellular processes going inside the central dogma of life and study the nucleotides, their chemistries and how they interact. Maybe you could be a microbiologist and study tardigrades and their phenomena. You can also be a geologist studying the formation of Earth, studying these asteroids. Well, these asteroids are very interesting, you know, because they are like those grandmothers who know a lot about our past. Asteroid Bennu is one of them, and it holds the secrets of the formation of the universe itself. And therefore, the OSIRIS-REx mission was planned. And now OSIRIS-REx mission is bringing the samples from Bennu to Earth. And who knows what we are going to find, pretty much exciting. So as a geologist, your purpose would be to study the rock, the history of Earth, and to analyze life's evolution. You can also be an astrophysicist. This is the Perseverance rover and its partner, Ingenuity, which was a key rover sent to Mars for doing astrobiological researches. It landed on the Jezera crater, but why the Jezera crater? Because the Jezera crater is the best evidence of a liquid ocean on Mars. You can clearly find the delta, the tributaries, carbonates and stuff, that's a pretty good hint that Jezera crater was a lake or a water body. And if it was a water body, then definitely life could be a possibility in those particular areas. So in a nutshell, you can be anybody, a physicist, chemist, biotechnologist, food technologist, architect, engineer. You can belong to any background and still become an astrobiologist. The only thing that you need to do is believe in yourself. Just take that first step. Believe that you can be an astrobiologist. You can contribute in this particular field and you're good to go. One interesting observation was that I told that you can be a food technologist or a foodie and still contribute to astrobiology. Well, that's pretty awkward, but that's the truth. Here you can see uh, an expert in food technology. Here you can see people hired, as known, they are known as tasters and their sole purpose is to taste the food, analyze them and decide what's the best food to be sent to space for the astronauts. So being foodie is no longer cliche, you can definitely earn respectable jobs if you are a foodie. So finally, answering the big question, how to become an astrobiologist? How can I become? What's a career path that I should follow? So this is the career path which is suggested by NASP. And you can definitely follow this path to become an astrobiologist right now, learn about astrobiology, attend the podcast, books, uh, read books, earn a degree in any of the field that you like, you can do your graduate work. You can build a community just like we are doing right now. Pine is doing, Space Onova is doing, that's community building, learning together. And then you earn your PhD. And finally, you look for funding opportunities, become a postdoctoral fellow somewhere. And then you start doing your own research in the field of astrobiology. And that's how you can get a glorious career in astrobiology. That's what NASA suggests. And talking about where you can know more about these journeys, well, definitely check out NASA Astrobiology Program, ask an astrobiologist. Various astrobiologists come and share their life's experience in those shows. And that's an eye opener for anybody who wants to be an astrobiologist in the future. So that's all I had for this presentation today. I do hope that I did not take uh, much time Here's the last invitation for anybody who wants to be a part of Space Onova's community of global space enthusiasts. You can join our Discord server and let us together stay tuned and create a space ecosystem where limit actually tends to infinity. Well, thank you so much for your patient audience, guys. It was really amazing for me to talk to you and I am pretty much open for answering a question. Feel free to ask any question that you might have. And thank you so much for this opportunity. So Brigitte, that was such an amazing presentation, literally, and I think the audience would have the same reaction. It was much interesting and we got to know about astrobiology so much in depth and it is much more about astrobiology than just space and biology. Thank you so much for delivering this wonderful talk and Thank you so we much, are Ritri. very thankful for you to be over here. 
i may open this to the audience now please put your questions in the chat box thank you thank you so much ruthvi thank you so much guys also for attending this session it's really fun to talk about astrobiology and so far we are all learning and getting involved more and i hope that we all can uh, contribute big time in the future when we all are equipped with the necessary weapon and arsenal that we really need to contribute and pretty much great to yeah so i can see certain questions do let them come in guys ask your question and i would be happy to answer any of the question that you might have regarding this field of astrobiology yeah so i can see a few um questions so deepika uh, advances in india in astrobiology is pretty much happening because you know uh, isro as i said has already announced that it is going to launch their own space station and also recently they are rolling out certain uh, opportunities for micro gravity experiments and astrobiological experiment to be taken as a payload for one of their pslv missions into low earth orbit so that's pretty much an opening for anybody who wants to do from india and in the future definitely we would be getting much more opportunities till then happy building your knowledge also kashish have asked that bioinformatics plays a big role in biology of space and definitely you know just as i gave an example you can study the genomics of the, those astronauts who are there you can study the extremophiles and understand how can they be so rigid and so much more different than the normal life forms on earth what makes them so unique and uh, that's how bioinformatics would play a big role i feel and i'm pretty much sure that in the coming years many more domains would definitely open this not th that that this won't be stagnant for sure a uh, thank you shubhrajit if any more questions you can please answer in the chat box we are running short of time so can you please dilara uh, can you please share your screen thank you shubhrajit sure um yes i hope you can see my screen clearly um yes. So for those who join just joined I'll just reintroduce myself I'm Dilara Dikin and uh, I just recently graduated from Bahçeşehir University and I uh, did my internship at uh, Pine Biotech in the Omics Logic Research Fellowship program and my project was on the the threat that radiation poses to humans in space and I will be I analyzed the adverse effects of specifically high LET radiation on the mouse gut microbiome and how this affects the nervous system and causes psychological disorders. So I'll give a short introduction of how bioinformatics is involved. And then I'll give an introduction to um, my project specifically, how I analyze my data. And then I'll be sharing my results and how I uh, concluded this. And um, I think that bioinformatics is really important because um, Uh, during my time at the wet lab i realized that we're producing such great amounts of data that uh, we need to process but uh, the speed of processing that data is not fast enough and bioinformatics and the uh, machine learning and other new technologies that are involved uh, are a great way to speed this process up and another thing that i'm fascinated by in bioinformatics is that the same raw data that is collected for one project can also be used for other researches as well and um So I uh, I want to shortly talk about my experience at Pine Biotech um and uh why I joined it uh, and it was because they have courses for everyone from beginner and, and then they bring them up to a, a more professional level and that's why I had an amazing experience uh, especially joined by my wet lab experience earlier uh, so it was like seeing the bigger picture and um to start with my project basically it was uh, on the prospects of space travel and how the advancement of space travel affects uh, the astro scientists in space and as subrajit it was talking about in his uh, presentation a lot of different fields uh, are involved in astrobiology and 
they don't necessarily have to uh, be simply about looking for life and space or, uh, you know, they don't have to be focused on one thing or the other. And that's why I decided to focus my uh, project specifically on the health of astro, uh, astronauts and astro scientists. And um, as you can see here on the chart on, on the graph on the right, the ISS, uh, which uh, involves different countries and different agencies, has started doing their projects uh, in numerous different fields, including biology and physical science. And um, I decided to choose this, uh, the health of astroscientists specifically, because to be able to continue this research out in space, we have to have healthy um, scientists out there. And um, I also think that uh, the landing of perseverance and the speed up of our um, space travel goals as humanity, uh, especially um, by, with starting colonies out in space, uh, it's really important to focus on research that affects the human health. So there are different types of radiation out in space, um, including ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. And my focus was specifically on ionizing radiation because it has high energy and this can cause chemical reactions. And I will frequently be talking about something uh, known as high LET radiation, and this stands for linear energy transfer, which is a dosimetry. It's a measure of the effect radiation has on materials. And this is a very curious type of radiation because high LET radiation can uh, easily be shielded for larger structures, but it can pass through microscopic structures such as cells. And uh, as we know, radiation can have various effects from uh, you know, major effects like cancer to minor effects like attention loss. And as you can see here, this, is, uh, this was taken from a report uh, from uh, NASA and they were uh, analyzing how uh, these listed uh, issues will be controlled or uncontrolled in the next 10 years. This was a 10 year plan for the planetary mission. And as you can see at the bottom, radiation exposure to human health is greatly uncontrolled, wh uh, whereas above you can see uh, other um, things like bone fracture or reduced aerobic capacity and host microorganism interactions. And these are uh, partially controlled or um, we're hoping to control them by 2028. But what we need to understand is that the radiation exposure affects all of the above uh, disorders. So um, another reason why it's extremely important is because as you can see on the right, uh, the six months on ISS, uh, on average, the radiation exposure is 10 times as much as the abdominal CT scan. So it is extremely important to consider radiation in our studies. So uh, for my methodology, I separated it into three different steps, major steps, and this was data exploration, statistical analysis, and my conclusions. So for the data exploration, first, I found a, a data set from NCBI, which contained um, 80 samples from the mouse gut microbiome. And these, uh, these ATVC samples were separated into uh, two categories. And basically this was uh, based on radiation and days. So uh, there was 0 0.1.25 and 1 GY radiation, and the samples were collected 10 and 30 days post-radiation. And then using the, um, the T-BioInfo platform, I used the Data2 pipeline and the PhiloSeq pipeline to find the abundances and also produce graphs, inc including the PCA, NMDS, and Shannon index, which I will be talking about in detail. And uh, to ensure that my observations from these uh, outcomes were correct, I conducted some statistical analysis, including ANOVA and T-tests. And as for the drawing conclusions part, uh, I was particularly focusing on lower doses since they penetrate cells more easily. And I wanted to see if the days also play a role because it's important in the acclimatization of bacteria. And uh, also because these bacteria can be uh, targeted uh, for uh, therapy for different diseases. Uh, 
Here we can see an NMDS graph, which is, stands for a non-metric multidimensional scaling graph. And here, as you can see, my focus was on days because I saw a better separation between 10 and 30 days post-radiation. And uh, as you can see for yourself as well, the 10 is circles and 30 is triangles. And um, the 30 days post-radiation was more spread out throughout the graph. Here we see a Shannon index graph, and this involves the um, biodiversity of the samples, and it measures the richness and evenness of the species in the sample, which is equivalent to the effective number of species. So here, as you can see, uh, when the comparison is made between all four doses of radiation, uh, lower doses, which is 0.1 and 0.25 GUI radiation, the biodiversity decreases in the samples. Um, and then I, this was another uh, graph output from the PhiloSeq pipeline. And for here, we can see several different things at once, including how the doses and days affect the abundance. And if these OTUs, which are operational taxonomic units, uh, which will be equivalent to the species as you will see later on, and how these are related to each other. And one thing that we can see is that OTU four and five are related. And we can also see that for compared to zero GUI radiation, 0.1 and 0.25 uh, at 10 days shows lower, uh, lower abundances of bacteria. So I decided to focus on these and I uh, did a statistical analysis. First, I started out with ANOVA which uh, I used three doses, zero GY for my control and 0.1 and 0.25 GY because um, from the previous uh, PhiloSeq out pipelines, uh, as you, I told you, the lower doses were more significant. So I decided to focus on those. And then my outcome was that the days did not have as much of a significant effect but the dosages did. And between these two variables, there was no interactions. So I conducted a t-test keeping the days constant and just analyzing uh, the doses of radiation compared to my control group. And I found that these four OTUs, OTU three and four, which, is, which are related and five and eight, which are related, as you can see uh, in, the, in the heat map as well, these were the significant OTUs, and these were um, significantly lower at 0.1 GY radiation uh, when compared to, to 0.25. And um, this was according to my threshold that I set at 0.25, 0 0.05 p-value. And I wanted to also check the abundances because um, it is important to see which families and genus of species increase and decrease and if these correlate to my statistical analysis. Here you can see that I compared those zero and 0.1 GY and um, the uh, uh, Lactobacillus bifido ercipelotricasi uh, families decreased whereas the Verrucomicrobia increased. And when I conducted uh, profiling and aligned the, these results with my t-test results, I found that um, OTU 3, 4, 5, and 8, as I mentioned previously, were uh, in the lactobacillus and bifidobacterium family. And as you can see, uh, the four species, lactobacillus gasseri and Johnsonia and bifidobacterium longum and castorius, uh, respectively were the results of my profiling. So why did I specifically um, focus on these? Uh, well, that's because these four species of bacteria have metabolites that affect the nervous system through the gut-brain axis. And they do this through the enterodendritic and vagus nerves, which play, uh, which play an important role in uh, transferring the stimulus from our guts to our brains. And uh, these four species were associated with, associated with the production of GABA, which stands for gamma aminobutyric acid, which is the chief inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. And uh, GABA is extremely important because when it produced in low levels, it causes depression and anxiety because of the lack of um, uh, 
because of the lack of inhibition of the stimulus. So there's constant stimulus. And these bacteria have protein coding genes called glutaminase and glutamine synthase, as you can see in this Gabbergic synapse. They are uh, GS and GLS. And uh, they, these are the same genes that are in the GABA pathway of humans. So uh, we can assume that as the abundance of, of bacteria that have these protein coding genes decrease, the amount of GABA in our uh, nervous system will also decrease. So we have two pathways that we can take uh, from here. And that is we can either produce, uh, we can either supply the body with exogenous GABA or we can uh, produce, uh, we can give the patients probiotics. But exogenous GABA in previous research did not give the desired effect. So probiotics uh, is uh, a more reasonable solution, a more effective solution in this case. So I can um, conclude this and gather up the findings of my research by saying that uh, according to my initial hypothesis, lower doses of high LET radiation has a greater impact on the gut bifidobacterium and uh, lactobacillus abundances, especially at 0.1 GY. And uh, the acclimatization period can be deduced as 10 days. That's because at 30 days post radiation, the, uh, the, when we analyze the samples, we did not see uh, a significant difference. Uh, on the contrary, the abundance levels were slightly increasing. And uh, this could be uh, a result of the length of exposure because we did not expose these uh, mice to radiation uh, uh, for very long. And I think that um, this uh, can be a further research by using a uh, combined effects of radiation and microgravity, and also increasing the length of exposure to see how it affects um, the nervous system and uh, the abundances of bacteria. So we can easily say that this was a precursor study on how probiotics can be used as a treatment in psychological diseases and how radiation affects the nervous system. And, um, sorry, yes. As for my limitations, um, one of my limitations was in taxonomic profiling because as you know, in bacteria, um, uh, there are sequences that are very similar, especially because for uh, profiling, we use 16S regions of bacteria. And for the same genus, they are very similar. So it's difficult to pinpoint which species of bacteria you're dealing with. Uh, and another one uh, was that the optimizing the parameters of the pipeline, but this helped me improve my approach to technical problems uh, in coding and in dealing with um, machine learning and its parameters. Also, another limitation um, that was caused due to the collection of samples in the wet lab was the sample size and doses. There were 10 samples per category. And if this uh, sample size increased, we could have more accurate results. And we should also have um, in between doses in, in between our four categories of doses. And we also look forward to research conducted on humans and astronauts directly. And that's because, that's because uh, as much as we can uh, analyze samples from mice, we do not know how the mechanism truly works in humans. So um, there are some researchers that collect samples from astronauts, but since the durations uh, that astronauts are out in space is much longer, that, uh, that is another limitation for those researchers. And here is my references. And I'd like to thank everyone for attending and listening. And I would like to thank everyone at Pine Biotech for their help and uh, especially uh, Harpreet Kaur and uh, Ilya Brodsky because they were my mentors and they helped me a lot during this research. And thank you to Rutvi for uh, initiating the Psyomics uh, seminars uh, because I think they're quite helpful, so. Thank you so much, Jalara. It was uh, really very nice to have you and Subrajit with us today. And uh, I may not be able to take the questions which all of you might have. 
we you can reach out dilara and uh, shubhrajit we'll share their mail ids with you and i would have to end the session here sorry because we have another session to begin with it was uh, sharp at uh, like three minutes before so i would now just end this meeting and thank you so much dilara and shubhrajit it was really really nice to hear to your work and uh, great work both of you like i'm really very really impressed and it was nice to know about your work and thank you so much everyone for joining today and uh, astrobiology seems to be a very promising field so all the we have some few research fellows as well here let's discuss on this too and uh, get working thank you so much everyone